Hey everyone, and welcome back to the second Wealth of Spania episode of The Rest Day with Jack Haig. In this episode, I catch up with Thorstein, one of my teammates again. We talk about all of the action that happened during the Welter so far in this first week. It's been a pretty exciting first week with the leadership changing a few times. Uh, now we have fellow Australian Ben O'Connor in the lead after a fantastic victory that he took going solo from the breakaway. We discuss a little bit about the transfer from Granada up to Vigo in Galicia. Uh, we had to take an aeroplane after stage nine from Granada. It's not something that is super typical that happens in a Grand Tour, but I've now done a few Grand Tours where aeroplane transfers have been a thing. Thorsten, this is the first time he's done it. We discuss a little bit about the logistics of doing a transfer like that. I also did an interview with my Swanya for this year's Welter, Yuri. We discussed the differences between doing Tour de France and Welter Espana. We also talk about his version of the transfer because, okay, you have some of the uh, staff members as well as all the riders. We, we are lucky enough that we take an aeroplane, but the buses, the truck, the food truck, all the material, that all needs to get transferred from the south of Spain all the way up to the north of Spain. It's about a thousand kilometers. Yuri kind of explains a little bit about what he had to do to help with that transfer. And then to finish off, I sat down and asked all my teammates while we were in the kitchen truck, just a few interesting short questions about the welter so far. I'll try and check back in with them, see how their predictions have gone in the next rest day. And then for myself, the world has been actually pretty nice. I've started to feel a little bit better. I managed to get a top 10 uh, stage finish on stage eight and Antonio was fourth in the stage. So that was a really nice moment for, for myself to feel back in the race again. Unfortunately, the next day, stage nine, I didn't have my best day and I fell out of GC, which was a little bit annoying. I think I'm now sitting in 20th. There's a lot of racing still to come. I think there's many opportunities. This year's welter is obviously very difficult. We've spoken about the vertical meters and the way that the route's been designed. So I think there could be a lot of good opportunities for myself and some of my teammates now going into the second week because unfortunately on stage nine, we lost Antonio Tiberi. He suffered a little bit of heat stroke because of the extreme temperatures that we've had so far in this welter. And we're down to five riders because Damiano went home. He wasn't feeling super well. Same with Reina Kaplinger. So now five riders, but plenty of opportunities. Hopefully we can report back on the next rest day with maybe a stage win or at least uh, moving back up in GC or something nice to talk about. I hope you enjoy this episode. I think this one is actually Quite nice. Me and Thorsten had some good energy and then I tried to get my teammates involved in the end there. So I hope you enjoy. And if you have any questions that you'd like me to ask at the dinner table, shoot them through on the Discord channel that Escape Collective has or send me a message on Instagram and I'll do my best to, to answer them. Otherwise, enjoy this episode and talk to you guys soon. See you. All right, I'm here having a massage. It's the first rest day of this year's Welter Espana. I'm with a different one year compared to Tour de France, but I thought I'd get Yuri's opinion on how the transfer went because in some Grand Tours, like this year's Welter Espana, we took an aeroplane and it makes it a whole lot more logistically difficult to transfer all the equipment, all the staff, buses, trucks, everything. So yesterday's stage, we finished in Granada. And now we're all the way up near Vigo in Galicia, which is almost a thousand kilometers. So Yuri, you're in charge of coming with the kitchen truck. I was. So yeah, like you said, I mean, I, the last podcast with Nick, you were talking about the rest day, which isn't really a rest day for us. So this is a little bit the same. We drove 
for 12 hours yesterday. Um, but it was fine. Traffic, no traffic. Um, so we got here at 10 p.m. A little bit before you guys. So basically what happened was the morning of stage nine, all the riders had breakfast inside the kitchen truck. And then Yuri and David, the other truck driver, they left as soon as we'd finished basically, and then drove all the way during the day to Vigo more or less. And then now you are quite lucky because it meant you had the full day here today. Whereas a majority of the staff drove maybe five hours last night after the stage. And then again, another five hours this morning. So it actually makes it even less of a rest day for the staff compared to normal. Whereas normally the staff, they can have a barbecue like we did in Tour de France. Um, the Sunday night, everyone has a pretty chill morning on Monday. Whereas here, majority of the staff, especially guys like the bus driver who was at the finish in Granada. And then obviously he didn't leave until quite late because he'd need to wait for us to finish. And now he's probably not going to arrive to the hotel until sometime tonight. Now, Yuri, other than the long drive in the truck, what else do you get up to today on the rest day? Um, a nap. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get some, a little bit of sleep because um, yesterday was a long day, even though, I mean, it's rest to drive, but it's just you're stuck in a truck for 12 hours. So uh, well, it was nice to... Uh, just have a little nap, just take a walk. We're very close to the beach. So uh, that was very nice. Uh, but like you said, yeah, there's still some part of the staff. I mean, it's 5.15 now and some of them are still driving. So it's a busy day. Now, maybe to describe a little bit the hotel that we're in, it's a interesting part of Spain that sometimes is maybe a little bit forgotten about because it's quite far away from a majority of the ma major cities and it's really beautiful here but the hotel's a bit of an older hotel but quite relaxed like you said quite close to the beach nice swimming pool which I might go to later um, other than that there's not a whole lot going on in this area of Spain is there <laughs> No, I mean, during the drive yesterday, it's funny to uh, <clears throat> see the different parts of Spain and here it's much greener because uh, we were like in a desert, desert area yesterday. This is beach. Um, but yeah, seems a little bit like a ghost town. <laughs> Not much going on. And we're about 10 degrees cooler as well. So we've come from uh, basically 12 days of close to 40 degrees every day. And right now it's probably a pleasant high 20s, maybe just touching 30 degrees outside, which was great for the easy ride that we did today. Now, to maybe go back to yesterday, so the finish of stage nine and how the riders did the logistics. First, stage nine, incredibly hard stage. Then we finished the stage in the city of Granada we were one of the few teams that actually kept the team bus. So I think majority of the other teams just either took a hotel room somewhere close to the finish line where the riders had shower after the stage and then had something to eat and then went into race organizer buses to go to the airport. Whereas there was maybe three or four teams. I know definitely us, UAE and a couple others had their team buses there. So after the finish, I actually had anti-doping which I was stressing about because it'd been super hot and I was quite dehydrated and I was worried I wouldn't be able to make a pee-pee. And so was the anti-doping officer. He was a little bit stressed that we might need to do the control in the aeroplane. But luckily, um, after about 20, 30 minutes and a lot of water later, I managed to, to get the anti-doping control finished. And then it was in the bus, quick shower and some food. And then we sort of waited for a police escort to take us from the city center of Granada to Granada airport. And all the riders went with a director, a doctor, and maybe two staff members. And then there was, I think, two charter airplanes that took all the riders and staff members from Granada to Vigo. They were actually, sometimes these charter flights end up being quite weird. We have them Every now and then in Grand Tours, I've maybe done four or five of them and 
is normally just random airline companies that you've never heard of. And it was actually quite a large airplane that we probably could have used to fly all the way to Australia with, which was quite strange. But uh, the way that it works is, yeah, we still needed to do the normal security. So we had a special line for the security. The Granada Airport's not so big. Went through the security like normal, waited in the, the airport for a tiny bit, boarded the flight at about 8.30 p.m. Then we took off. It was about an hour, hour 10. Landed in Vigo, maybe around 9.45. Then I think we were... Again, race organizer bus out waiting for us outside the airport. It was all divided into maybe nine or 10 buses because obviously every team has a different hotel. We were alone in our bus. We drove an hour. And then what time did we arrive at the hotel, Yuri? 11, no? Yeah, it was about 11, just after 11. And then I think a lot of riders uh, struggled to get to sleep. Obviously, we'd done almost five hours of racing. Then you do all of this travel, buses, the airport, everything like this. And I think I was quite lucky. I tried pretty hard to get to sleep closer to one o'clock. But I heard some riders saying that they didn't really get to sleep until 1.30, 2 o'clock. And then, yeah, I was uh, quite sleepy this morning. And then managed to just have an hour and a half nap before coming to see Yuri. Now, Yuri is also part of the special group that has, have done the Tour de France and the welter and i thought i'd ask Yuri his opinion from staff member what are the differences and which one do you like better and how many times have you done tour welter uh i've done the tour four times now and the welter three times but back to back back to back three times um yeah yeah we talked about this a little bit earlier i mean the tour it's the tour and I feel there's such a special vibe at the tour. Um, I mean, I guess for riders, but for the staff also, you you want to be selected, you want to go, because uh, it is the biggest race in the world. Um, and I guess you're not a swanee if you haven't done the tour. Um, Vralta is a little bit more relaxed. There is kind of this holiday vibe, even though we're working hard, but there's... The, the weather's nice, the food is good. Hotel are way better than the tour, I would say. Um, so that's always nice. Um, yeah, what about you? What do you think? Yeah, it's pretty similar as well. I've done Tour Vuelta, I think only twice. But I always enjoy doing Vuelta Espana for similar reasons to what you said, where it's just a little bit less stressful. There's a little bit less pressure on everything. The roads I find are generally nicer to race on. They're a little bit bigger, a little bit more sort of flowing. We have a little bit less road furniture. And then, like you said, the hotels are generally at a slightly higher standard or at least you get slightly bigger hotel rooms. So it's a bit easier to open the suitcase. And I think especially for you guys to open the massage table and do massage in the room, it's quite a bit easier. And... <coughs> We're lucky, obviously, we have the kitchen truck, but I think for you guys, the, the food in France and staying in Campanillos and small rooms is not very enjoyable and having some Spanish food is quite nice. Right, I think last time you were discussing maybe the worst restaurant with Nick. Yes. Here we could maybe rate the other scale where the five best ones. All right. could be hard. O on this, we started this year's Welter in Portugal, to be honest. Yes. Now... We actually spent quite a few days there because you spend the three days before the race and then we did three stages there. Portugal or Spain? Spain. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the, the food? Spain. Yeah, that's pretty good. No, for, for us, it doesn't change too much, to no. be honest. Uh, Portugal was super hot. It was quite nice to start in Lisbon. I've been there a few times for holiday, but... I was maybe a slightly disappointed that we didn't see more of Lisbon. Yeah. Whereas like the TT, I was hoping that we'd kind of start more in the center of Lisbon and see more of sort of like the iconic pictures of like you have the trams in Lisbon going up the hills, whereas I didn't really get the feeling that we were actually in Lisbon. No, you were outside the city. and Yeah. yeah. And if I true. could rearrange the route... <laughs> 
I would have gone three stages in Portugal, but just kept going north and then done this first week in like Galicia, uh, Asturias, Cantabria, and then gone to the south. Yeah. All right. Time to flip over. All right. Now, unfortunately, yesterday we had two riders abandon the race. Antonio Tabiri suffered a bit of heat stroke and then Raina Kaplinger had been suffering a little bit with... Uh, a little bit of sickness and then Damiano also abandoned during the middle of the first week. So now we're down to five riders, which ironically is the same amount of riders that we finished the Tour de France with, but that didn't happen until the third week. So now it's a bit of an empty bus, a bit of an empty kitchen truck, but it's also a little bit nicer because everyone gets their own soigneur, Time moves a bit faster. You have a heap more space in the bus to spread out. You can move your backpack around. Does it change much for you, Yuri? Um, yes and no. I mean, yes, like you said, now it's yeah, basically one twenty per uh, rider. So that's pretty cool. So everybody after the stage will get one hour massage and then that's it. Um, so on that part, it's easier. On the other hand, I mean, we do the food for the staff and the staff stay the same. So we're still 22 people. <clears throat> That's basically four staff member per rider. So, um, and these guys need to eat, sleep. And um, so on that end, it doesn't change much. It's actually a crazy statistic that there's four riders per staff member. <laughs> oh, no, sorry, four staff members per rider. But yeah, basically... When you don't need to share a soigneur for a massage, everyone, both riders and soigneurs, gain an hour in the evening. So some teams like uh, UAE, they always do one soigneur per rider in Grand Tours, which I think is actually quite smart because then everything happens an hour earlier. You finish massage an hour earlier, you can go to the kitchen truck and have dinner an hour earlier. You can be in your room an hour earlier. And then if you, that means you get... 30, 40 minutes extra sleep, then it kind of adds up after three weeks in a Grand Tour. So we're at the end of the first week of this year's Welter Espana, and it's been quite hard, to be honest. Probably harder than the first week of the Tour de France. We had a lot more vertical meters, and we've seen maybe some interesting tactical decisions with Ben O'Connor now leading the Welter by quite some margin. Now, Yuri, do you actually get to watch much of the welter or much of a bike race when you're working? Uh, well, last week I was doing the hotel. Uh, so on the hotel duties, when you come in, you put all the luggage. So the first thing we do is turn on the TV on every room. So while we're putting the suitcase, we can watch the, <laughs> we can watch the race with you guys. But yeah, it's been very um, interesting and very open. Uh, open well that for the moment so that's exciting for the fans watching I, I assume and now do you think that having so many vertical meters in a grand tour to put in context this year I think Wealth of Espana has 61,000 meters which is about 11,000 meters more than this year's Tour de France which already felt quite mountainous do you enjoy having such a hilly race in terms of uh, being a spectator or do you wish that there was maybe some more sprint stages because essentially we almost have no sprinters here and almost all the sprint stages we've done now i think there's maybe one in the last week other than that i think there's middle weeks basically all mountain stages um yeah for us i mean to watch it's more spectacular and more open but on the other i mean i feel bad for all these guys that Try to uh, go for a sprint and there's nothing. So, yeah, it's a bit of mixed feelings. Now, maybe on to some predictions. We've kind of fallen a little bit out of GC now with Antonio going home. And I had a bit of a bad day yesterday on stage nine. So, unfortunately, I'm no longer in the hunt for that top 10 GC place at the moment. Maybe with a lucky breakaway, I can get there. But... Who do you think is going to win this year's Welter? I think it's going to be very difficult to go get Ben O'Connor. Me too, actually, mate. I think uh, maybe Bora uh, <laughs> underestimated themselves there. And I think we also saw that 
Primoz maybe wasn't as strong as they were hoping on stage nine into Granada there because I think he actually cracked a little bit on the climb and Ben was actually very sneaky in the finish and managed to steal some bonus seconds, which I didn't believe Bora would have expected to finish stage nine with more time to gain than they started. No, very true. I think they uh, they underestimated uh, the Australian and I think it's going to be uh, tough to go get him until the third week. So we'll see, but uh, it's going to be very open. Even the top 10 is very open. And I think with the style of uh, routes that we have with so many vertical meters and it becomes very hard to control breakaways. So I think we can see maybe this top 10 sort of shake up a little bit more with guys getting the breakaway very similar to Adam Yates yesterday who had sort of not really was in contention for GC then had an amazing day obviously winning the stage but obviously putting himself back I think into top five GC contention there. So I hope this middle week can be quite interesting and then we can catch up again on the next rest day and talk about everything that has happened and hopefully had an easier transfer than taking an aeroplane and you driving 12 hours. So top 10 is not over, Jack. No, it's it, it's <laughs> potentially coming. It's potentially coming. We'll check in on that project in, in a week's time. Thanks for that, Yuri. Thank you. Dawson, welcome back to the podcast. It's been about nine days since the last time we spoke, well, 10. Um, How's the first week of Welter of Spain gone for you? Oh, thank you, thank you, Jack. Um, I think I would say for everybody it's been a warm week, yeah? <laughs> or 10 days. It has been an incredibly warm week. We're now on the rest day in Galicia, which is the northwest of Spain. We flew in last night to the Vigo airport and it's been a pleasant maybe mid to high 20s all day. Now, for the first time in a long time, I had a sweater on today, so that was quite nice. Yeah, I saw a few people breaking out the the hoodies and the sweaters this morning <laughs> for breakfast. That was uh, quite a surprise. I even dug down deep into the the dark parts of my suitcase that I haven't seen for a very long time, and I took mine out just in case. Yeah, it's been pretty nice eh? because at the end of the day, you wear almost the same clothes every day. You take on shorts and t-shirts. You have one race suit you wear all day, so it's been light packing. It has made packing incredibly easy for the stages because I just bring my summer skin suit, my summer gloves, and my aero socks in my backpack, and that's about all that needs to go in there. No jump art, no <laughs> tracksuit pants, no leg warmers, no vest. Yeah, because sometimes I feel like when we change hotel, it's so stressful. Eh? You need to pack everything up and down and everything. But here it's been so pleasant. Eh? Like I really enjoy packing down because I, I don't take anything out of the suitcase. Maybe <laughs> I change a t-shirt and that's it. Eh? Yeah, I'm the same. I basically just rotate between two pairs of shorts and two t-shirts. And then I just use the same skin suit for basically one week. Yeah, and then you have two boxers, one for washing and one clean. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, have, I have two pairs of socks and two pairs of underwear. And then just I just rotate every day these same things. Um, <laughs> all right, let's actually start talking about a little bit the bike race. <laughs> How How's it going? We started in Lisbon, obviously, with the individual time trial. I was explaining to Yuri that I was maybe a tiny bit disappointed that we didn't really see much of Lisbon, even though like we started there, but the iconic images of Lisbon with like the tram and the city going up the steep hills, but we actually didn't really see much of Lisbon. To be honest, we wasn't really in Lisbon. We was outside yeah, Lisbon. That's what I mean. Like it yeah. was a little bit disappointing. No, it was really like we didn't see people. We didn't say one train. It was really like disappointing. And then since we only had the time trial there, we yeah, we didn't really spend time in there either. And how was the time trial for you? What did uh, you get up to? I went pretty easy. Enjoyed. It was really windy, so I was really scared about crashing, actually. So I was really nervous because Neil asked me before the stage, you want to change your front wheel? I say, no, I'm a big boy. I don't <laughs> need to change the front wheel. And I got out there and Neil said on the radio, get out of the schemes, you're going to crash. <laughs> so to put it in context, uh, for the time trial, I think we have the choice between a 60 or an 80 mil front wheel. Yeah. Neil's the director here, Neil Stevens. And um, yes, the time trial, even though it was quite short, it was hot and very windy. Yeah. Very gusty, actually, which makes it even 
scary. If it's just constantly windy, it's not so bad, but it was very sort of gusty and yeah. uh, not so nice. No, it was really not nice. Though. But I went easy, so for me, yeah, I could not complain. It was a long day, and then we started the second stage with sprint, no? Yeah. But yes, the time trial was an incredibly long day. We all went for an easy ride in the morning, 45 minutes or something like this. Yeah. Pretty chill. And then, yeah, a lot of time just hanging out to do 11 kilometers. Yeah. And, and then we had dinner at uh, like 9 o'clock, 8 o'clock. Nine yeah, o'clock. it was morning. really late. But yeah, Brendan McNulty won. Quite impressive, to be honest. Yeah, I heard he did some impressive watts. Sir. Yeah, I think uh, he did some very large watts. Now, uh, yeah, second run day was a uh, sprint day. Caden won. Good, because I didn't remember. Well yeah. done. Caden <laughs> won, I remember. <laughs> we went through the twisty part of Portugal. I don't remember where the finish was. I just remember it was on the line all day and sprinting out of corners and stuff. Yeah, I actually don't remember much of the, the stage. I, it was hot, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, every day's been hot. <laughs> um, then, yeah, the next day was the last day in Portugal. Yeah, I think so. I don't remember. Oh, my God, we're so tired. No, last day in Portugal, because I remember we was talking in the evening. Um, do we change the clock or not? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we got the daily plans, which we get every day. And then uh, Xavi, who do the daily plan, he put everything in European time. And then we were staying in Portugal and we had... Obviously, the clock was one hour earlier. Yeah. Later. Later. One hour later. Yeah, one hour later. Man, yeah. time zone is so confusing. Yeah. But yeah, so basically we had the hotel on the Portuguese-Spanish border. Yeah. But we were sleeping in the Portuguese side, but starting the, in the stage in the Spanish side. Yeah. And the daily plan was all in Spanish time, <laughs> even though all our phones and everything were in Portuguese time. So there was quite a bit of confusion around <laughs> when to wake up and when not to wake up. In reality, it's not that complicated. It was just an hour different. But during a Grand Tour, it seemed very complicated in the moment. Yeah. Um, how's the heat been? It's been the topic of probably the first week is how hot it's been. To be honest, I was feeling really, really good. Until I think this three days ago, maybe when we went for the sprint stage, huh? Oh, no. the Cordoba stage. Yeah, yeah the Cordoba stage. Yeah. Van Aert one. Yeah. Super hot. Renowned Super for hot. being very hot in uh, Cordoba. Until that day, I was feeling really good and comfortable in the heat. And then I came to that day and I felt like I was going to die. Yeah. Every day has been quite hot, but we've done quite well here with having a lot of people on the side of the road with many uh, water bottle points with ice. So one of the things we do is we actually cut up female uh, leggings. Yeah, leggings. Yeah. And uh, basically stuff ice in them, and then we can stuff that down our jersey and then just heaps and heaps of cold water from the side of the road in the car. Yeah. Now, another controversial thing that probably happened during this week was the breakaway stage where Ben O'Connor won. Yeah, it was quite uh, impressive. Huh? Super impressive because it was quite hard in the peloton, I'm not going to lie. Uh, yeah, I remember like I was I was really tired when I came across the finish line. Yeah. Didn't have much time off the front and he rode, I don't know how many kilometers alone. Yeah, it was a, it took a really long time for the breakaway to form because we had quite a flat start and then we had a really long climb where the first breakaway of the day got neutralized by movistar yeah and then the second breakaway formed which had ben in it mistake by bora to give ben so much time you think yeah i would say so yeah i would uh probably agree with you i think uh maybe bora could be regretting that a little bit in the the coming days and week and a half but only time will tell whether that was a smart or not smart decision to make. Yeah. Um, but it makes it quite interesting, I think, for spectators and also for us to talk about at the dinner table. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people in Norway, they call it uh, cowboy, cowboy uh, cycling. Like, you don't know what, <laughs> what is happening. Everybody, like, it's like jitter race. Eh? Like, everything can happen every day. Eh? But do you think this is a little bit because of the amount of vertical meters we have in this race? And the way that it's now quite hard to control breakaways. Like even yesterday on stage nine, it was quite hard to control the breakaway. 
I think also what makes quite a big difference is um, when you first make it into the breakaway, it's much easier to have always hydration on point, no? This is a very good point, actually. Because, because we have this uh, Kern Pharma mm -hmm. motorbike who gives us motor and uh, bottles from the side of the road, and sometimes they give ice, and yeah. Uh, it's much easier when you're in the breakaway because also you generally have your team car behind yeah. you. Yeah. And you can basically go back for unlimited water and ice whenever you want. And I think this has probably been one of the biggest factors so far in this welter was how people managed the heat. Yeah. So another thing that we actually have been doing to help manage the heat is we have a cooling protocol which we use after the stage. So finish the stage, see this one year after the finish line, normally tip a bottle of water over my head because I'm really hot and the yeah. water's nice and cold. Then we go back to the bus and then the Swanyers have a big esky full of water and ice and towels inside. And then basically we just get a beach towel that's yeah. wet and cold, put it on top of us to try and cool down the core body temperature as fast as possible. Yeah. No, I think it's been really good. Huh? And I think a lot of the other teams have made fun of us because we had so much water and stuff on the, on the finish line. Like we have this big trolley full of water, right? Huh? Yeah, we, it's become quite trendy. I, now that I'm a father, I see a lot of other families and you have like these big collapsible <laughs> trolleys that families always use when they go to the beach. Basically, we had this one year to have this for us, but it's just full of water and ice. Yeah. <laughs> no, and then uh was three days ago, yeah? yeah. When Arendsman collapsed. Yeah, the it was like stage. Yeah, it was actually... Our doctor and our Swanee who gave him water and ice and got him to the shadow. and Yeah, exactly. So at the end of the stage, I think um, Pyman from Ineos was struggling quite a bit, probably yeah. with some symptoms of heat stroke. And uh, our doctor was there and our Swanee has had all the ice and water and stuff there and helped cool him down before he could get some medical assistance. Yeah. Maybe we should probably move on to the final stage yeah. of this first week, stage nine. Maybe the queen stage of the world tour. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Stage 20 looks pretty hard. Yeah. Uh, let's wait and see before we officially call it the queen stage. But it was a mighty long and hard day. Yeah. Um, you got in the breakaway. I was in the breakaway. 500 watts for two minutes to get in the breakaway. <laughs> yes. <laughs> First of all, we started down on the, the coast near Malaga and we did, I think, maybe eight or nine kilometers neutral yeah. and started up a climb and it felt so humid and hot. I was sweating so much. Yeah, I was feeling like um, like a sauna, to be honest. It was really yeah. warm. Huh? Yeah, but I think like the temperature in terms of like degrees, yeah. it was not super hot, but just the feeling and yeah. the humidity was crazy. Yeah, because we was also closer to the sea yeah. and then more humidity and I was really not nice, huh? And uh, made the breakaway. Made the breakaway. Pretty strong breakaway. Yeah, it was super. First, we were eight guys. I was thinking, yeah, quite a nice breakaway. And then we went down a descent, like quite twist twisted descent, I would say. We went into a small town and then suddenly we were 30 guys or something. Yeah. And three it guys from UAE with yeah, Soler in front. He went full gas on all, every climb but until we had like four and a half minutes. Yeah. So the stage finished in Granada yeah. and a lot of us, I think in the Peloton, probably know the roads around Granada quite well from doing altitude camps in Sierra Nevada. And the stage winner, uh, Adam Yates, a bit of trivia for you. He actually got married in Granada <laughs> and he's spent a long time in Sierra Nevada doing altitude camps. So he knows the roads super well. I know the roads quite well from doing altitude camps there. I yeah. believe you also know the roads. Yeah, I think half the Peloton has yeah. been there and yeah. knows them quite well. They're all the climbs, uh, the climbs that we do when you're there in altitude. The first major one was Monocho. Yeah. Now, this climb basically has zero shade yeah. the whole way up. It's super hot. I saw my Garmin, I had 43 degrees in average of the whole climb. Yeah, so I think I saw the max temperature on my Garmin was 46 degrees yeah. and it was on that climb. Yeah. It's so hot that climb, <laughs> even in training camp when yeah. you're there. Um, Solar, I believe, paced the climb super hard. Yeah. You went over the top with a small group. Yes, eight guys who was on the top, which was yeah quite nice. I was quite comfortable there. So. Then we went the de the descent uh, in headwind, which was also pretty nice. Huh? Mm -hmm. I was not, uh, you almost didn't need to paddle. Come down to the 
bottom of the famous last climb or what is it? Yeah, so uh, basically the stage we did uh, two laps yeah. of this super steep climb that I can't remember the name of. No, me neither. Uh, it's about seven kilometers long. I think averages over 10%. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you basically descended down direction Granada and then on the outskirts of the city of Granada, you turned right and then you headed up a undulating climbing road that went next to a dam before you then started the extra, climb, the right? extra steep climb that we yeah. did uh, twice. Yeah, which was super nice. I, I got in there, was feeling really good, went up the towards the top of the uh, yeah, small climb before real climber. Starting to feel a bit shit. Got into the real climb. Don't really remember anything after this. You might have suffered a tiny bit of heat stroke. Yeah. I mean, the last thing I remember was uh, having ice gel from the car going super slow. And the next thing I remember is like when we turned right, uh, when it started to get uh, not so steep anymore. And Neil told me, Jack is one minute behind you. I was like, okay, now I need to make it to the top. <laughs> So yeah, it was uh, it was an interesting uh, 30, 20 minutes, 30 minutes there. So something you mentioned there was the ice gel. This yeah. is something that we use uh, to try and cope with the heat. And it's basically <coughs> a slightly larger packaging of a regular gel yeah. that's basically frozen. And it's more or less just like a calippo or yeah. like a frozen yeah. icy pole. Yeah. But in the end, it's actually so hard for them to stay frozen by the time you have them. It's basically just liquid. Yeah. But if you do get it from the car, it's frozen yeah. or you have before the start of the stage, it's actually quite nice. Yeah. I, I had, The last thing I remember, I thought, mom, mamma mia, <laughs> this is cold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it was like, for the first time I got it out of the car and it was really like a popsicle, you know? Yeah. It was really cold. That's a, that's a treat when it happens yeah. like this. In the peloton, we did quite a similar thing, quite hard up, on chill down. I was actually feeling quite good, basically until the same point as you. <laughs> Turned right, climbed up towards the dam, and I was like, man, I really don't feel that good. And then I started to look around, and I was like, geez, this, this group's much bigger than I would like, considering <laughs> yeah. the way that I'm feeling. And there's normally not this many guys here when I feel like this. Yeah. And then, yeah, we started this steep climb. I went uh, the first five minutes was quite steep small road then you have a small downhill section and i think i did like 450 watts or something like this for the first five minutes of the climb because so i knew i needed to stay with the group there's maybe 20 of us left you did this small downhill section into the last maybe four or five kilometers of the climb but i, I just didn't have it yeah. and um yeah you waited for me at the top yeah and we were maybe two minutes behind the group on the top yeah on the top one minute in the bottom yeah and i'm not gonna lie i was a bit demoralized at the top knowing that i need to do that whole lap again before then getting to the finish yeah i was really happy because i know the feeling when when you have to go all out but you don't have anything to go all out with. yeah it is such a shit feeling yeah it's like sort of i know that i can go now until the bottom of the real climb and then i can swing off and i can go easy to the top yeah um anyway adam gates won the stage Super really impressive. impressive. Yeah, super impressive. Uh, ben O'Connor won the sprint for the third place out of the peloton. He was second, no? No, Richie oh, Calipas. Oh, Calipas, yeah. True. Even he was, he was also really impressive. Huh? Sneaky, uh, hot take. I reckon he could be a podium contender. The way that he rode yesterday was very impressive. I felt like we was going pretty fast on the first lap of Monachil. Yep. And I think he went one minute faster than us. Yes, because he bridged from the yeah. group to you guys. So that was... I, I also believe he can be on the podium. Huh? And then, yeah, Ben won the sprint for third, yeah. which then put him even further in front of Primoz. <laughs> yeah. He took bonus seconds, which I don't think Bora would have expected. Yeah. Um, then after the race, we had the aeroplane transfer. This is your first Grand Tour that you've done airplane transfer with. I was super excited. I've done quite a few, actually. I'm not a big fan of it. Oh, it was super shit, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> like, I got out of the bus because we, some guys had uh, organized this bus because their bus was uh, leaving early to maybe make it to the airport, no? No, to make it here. Oh, to make it here, yeah. Yeah. And uh, Neil Stevens, he was saying, no, I want our guys in our bus with our alias bus driver. So we drove with the uh, team bus to the airport. 
I got out of the bus and I said, now I go to security. I didn't wait for anybody. I was almost first in security. It was super nice. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it was like such a long queue. And I really hate like moments like this because you're already fighting with the peloton. People in peloton already for 10 days or nine days. And then you have to also kind of fight a bit in the security. <laughs> but it is a bit of a weird <laughs> situation because you basically just spend the last nine days doing a bike race against all these people. And then you just stand in the security line next to each other. And you're like, oh, hey. Yeah. Hey. And I find also cyclists, they're a bit like maybe socially awkward is the word. Yes. Because like nobody wants to like really say hello. Nobody like, <laughs> <laughs> nobody wants to do anything. Everybody like pretends that the other people are not there and like there are there's normal people which is super strange yeah it is a bit of a weird situation but anyway airplane flight went well yeah. we arrived at the hotel relatively late though to super be big plane i would say yes i spoke to this with uh yuri i said we could have flown to australia with this plane yeah it was business class in front huh? yeah, yeah it was uh quite strange but yeah. And also there was no luggage underneath yeah. because we could only travel with our backpacks all yeah. the luggage like big suitcases and bikes and stuff or went in vans that drove here today. Yeah. So it was, um, and, uh, I don't uh, say a nice experience, but it was an experience at least. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. it was here maybe 11 o'clock? Yeah, 11, 11.30. Yeah. Um, so it was quite, uh, I went to bed around 12. Yeah. I woke up three o'clock in the night. I didn't find the toilet because I didn't uh, want to turn on the light because I was so <laughs> tired. So I almost peed in my pants because <laughs> I was so tired. And then I luckily could find it because for people, you can obviously not see it, eh? but the B-Day and the toilet is straight over each other. So I went directly to the B-Day and I couldn't understand a thing. Yeah. <laughs> so I actually did the same thing because we change hotels all the time. And again, like we don't really like to turn the light on uh, at nighttime. Uh, I went to go to the bathroom as well during the middle of the night and I peed in the bed. Like, <laughs> it feels really weird. And then I realized, I was like, oh, it's the wrong hotel. There's a different hotel. It's different orientation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, yeah, now now we're here today. Yeah. Rest day. Here. Yeah, super nice rest day. What'd you do on the bike? Um, I did 10 minutes, 30-30, just to keep the body alive. And I didn't do a single interval. Yeah. I just rode around. We did two hours. Yeah. I did a quick Google search before we left for training and searched for specialty coffee. And there is, was actually a really, really nice cafe. Yeah, it was super nice. Huh? My experience got a little, uh, a little bit broken because um, I got bit by a bug just before. <laughs> so I was slowly turning red during the coffee stop uh, <laughs> so our doctor was a bit worried but uh i'm no more fine. reaction yeah. you're, <laughs> no you're, more you're reaction. all good yeah um now rest day is almost coming to an end you yeah. go to dinner pretty soon yeah but what are the predictions for next week and who's going to win welter and Best and worst moment of this welter so far. Okay, best and worst moment. I think best uh, moment was when Antonio was four and you was ten, no? Yeah. On the stage. Which was Saturday. The yeah, day Saturday. And then worst moment was uh, if we can take everything about yesterday. This is the worst moment. Yeah. Except the breakfast because I really like our breakfast. Yeah, so... For context, that's also probably the best and worst moments for me. The uh, stage eight where Antonio did well, I was 10th on the stage. Everyone was quite happy. We, we did a good overall team performance. And then just everything around <laughs> the, next the, the Sunday stage nine, <laughs> yeah. because it was just, we were awake early, a long transfer in the morning. The stage was horrible. It was super hot. I did a bad performance. <laughs> um, then the airplane travel afterwards. Yeah. I Plus. had one exception though. Yeah. I remembered that the doctor and the media man yeah. had bought Mars bar ice creams that oh. have been waiting in the back of the bus. I think they've been sneaky eating them. Yeah. And I remembered that there was a freezer in the back of the bus with a Mars bar ice cream. Nice. And I took a shower and then just sat on the esky at the back of the bus eating my Mars bar ice cream, <laughs> contemplating life before yeah. getting on the airplane. <laughs> oh, nice. Huh? Um, all right, Torsten. Yeah. Let's catch up again on the next rest day. Yeah. Hopefully. First. I think Adam Yates is going to win. Whoa, that's a hot take. Yeah. He's one minute 30 behind. 
hot take. Adam Yates is going to win. Yeah. My hot take is Richie's going to be on the podium. Yeah. But uh, let's reassess our predictions yeah. in a week's time. Thank you. Thanks for having a chat. Thank you. All right. Just finished dinner in the kitchen truck on the first rest day of Welter. I got my five favorite teammates in the kitchen <laughs> truck. <laughs> now, I want to ask best and worst moments of the first week of Welter. First up, Fran. The best one will probably be stage six because it's the first time I was able to pace anyone up a climb <laughs> in my life. And uh, yeah, we were like on top, on top of the first climb and it was like 40 people with 20 GC guys and then uh, 20 other guys that were lucky enough to be in the breakaway that day. So that was like a nice moment. And then the worst one is probably when I saw Antonio yesterday on the climb. He wasn't looking too good. So... Uh, yeah, and it was our GC hope, so that was a bit demoralizing, but yeah, we move. Uh, next question. It's your first Grand Tour. Yeah. Tomorrow, uncharted territory, longest stage race. You prepared? Yeah, uh, this today was also the, <laughs> my first rest day in my life, so exciting. So yeah, what happens tomorrow, I have no idea, but for now I feel pretty good. And uh, yeah, with Antonio being out of the race, it opens up... Uh, a bit of uh, opportunity for us in a breakaway. So yeah, I'm gonna try to, to use it. Many milestones have been hit in this Grand Tour. First rest day, longest stage race. Any uh, epiphanies or moments of uh, wisdom that you can share for first Grand Tour, first rest day? No, really, I just go, I try not to think about how, how many stages I have got to go to Madrid. Uh, it's 12, by the way, and it sounds a lot, but yeah. Uh, I'm looking forward to the next race day already. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's it. And the party in Madrid, hopefully. All right. Next up, the Polish man, Kamil Kratik. Best and worst moments of this year's Vuelta Espana. I think the best moment was after stage eight, when the Antonio was fourth. Big, uh, uh, white jersey again you were 10 that was really nice moment for a team and then I think the worst one was the second last climb on the stage number nine <laughs> that was uh, I was cooked on the climb and then I felt so bad that <laughs> and I had in mind that I need to do one more this climb that was I think the best the, the worst moment uh, so far on this race all right we've already heard from Torsten now, my favorite German friend, Yasha, best and worst moments. Uh, no, like Kami said, I would say the best moment was also when Antonio fight back for the white jersey. Unfortunately, he's out. Um, which brings me also to the one of the worst moments um, of the team. Personally, the worst moment was the stage which Ben O'Connor won. The stage okay. frame was in the breakaway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I dropped well, like 110k to go and we were like with six guys. <laughs> <laughs> and I had did the most work alone to the finish. So yeah, to, to fight for the time limit was, was nasty. I believe you took a nap in the bus after the stage. Uh, yeah, yeah, I got something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just really cooked and empty. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes and no question. Should aeroplane transfers be in uh, Grand Tours? Yes. No. Yes. No. No. Who's going to win this year's Welter? I would say... Ben does it. Roglic. Adam Yates. Ben O'Connor. Ben O'Connor. All right, we'll come back on the next rest day and see how we've done. <laughs> uh, favorite dessert? The lemon cheesecake. Crema Catalan. Mm. Kerbule. Lemon cheesecake. Lemon cheesecake. Favorite? Post-race meal so far in Welter? Uh, probably the spicy rice I had the other day. Pancakes. 
Pancakes. Arroz con leche. Milk rice. What do you have on your pancakes? Jam. Yeah, jam. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so on the kitchen truck, we're lucky enough to have an actual rocket espresso machine rather than pod machines like most teams. Now, how do you have your coffee? And how many of them do you have inside the kitchen truck? And then how many do you have inside the bus? I just have one double shot of espresso and then uh, a lot of milk. So let's say a cappuccino or a flat white. And in the bus? None. Two in the kitchen truck and one in the bus. So I do two in the bed because I make <laughs> obviously coffee in bed. And then I have one in the kitchen truck and one in the bus. I actually did have a request from someone to give the full breakdown of your coffee setup after our previous podcast, but maybe we save this for a, a Torsten special next rest day. We can do coffee <laughs> breakdown with Torsten. Um, I drink two flat whites in the morning and no coffee before race. Uh, two Americanos in the kitchen truck and then maybe one decaf because... I try to be a responsible human being and not do too much caffeine. And then yeah. if it's a hard start, uh, one coffee in the bus. And one more thing at the end. I just want to make a shout out to Sergio too. I hope you enjoy your dinner. Ciao, buddy. <laughs>